Welcome to a very special edition of Gen XYZ. Not that every week is not special, but this week is more special than most because of our, our guest, a very special guest, of course, uh, Dr. Josh Hammonds. Josh, welcome. Thanks for having me. This is so fantastic. Um, yeah, it's been great connecting recently, and I'm excited for today. So thanks for having me on. Yeah, we've gone from, yeah. from zero to 60. <laughs> right. Where like we didn't, you know, we, we didn't know each other. We met on LinkedIn. We've, we've got together in person. We've done a podcast yeah. and now, yes. now live stream. I love it. I love it. It's the only way I go is zero to 60. That's, that's, that's my preferred direction and speed. So that's great. Well, what, one of our traditions on the show is to, is to start with introductions. So okay. we'll, you'll have to participate in that uh, if you're willing. So Ashley, go ahead and, and take it away. Okay, so again, we are called At Work with Gen XYZ, and we have our first guest today. Um, we're going to go and introduce our Gen X. Who's our Gen X? We get, we going we're going down. So we're, we're going we're going okay. we're going different Let's start with order. X. Well, I'm the Gen X, of course. You're the you Gen X. Yeah. By, by by looking at me. Yes. Yeah. So I'm Pete. I'm the Gen Xer. It's great. Okay. Millennial. Right. Well, I'm I'm Peter. I'm the I guess I'm I'm. I'm Gen Y, millennial here. So, okay. <laughs> Josh. So I, I'm a Zennial, uh, and okay. so I'm right. Uh, depends on if you're looking at the Cambridge or the U.S. I'm 1980, and I. Oh, you are right, right on the cusp. Yeah. Line. Yes. Okay. So you, you, we can't make fun of you as much as we can make fun of Peter, only partly. That I was like, I'm, I'm 88, so I'm like solidly in the middle. Yeah, that's a solid millennial right there. Because we only have one rule, really, on, on Gen XYZ, Josh, and that it, one thing we agree upon, without exception, is that Isn't nobody likes millennials. That's that's <laughs> that's the one thing. Yeah, that's that's oh, that, that that's not my rule. I didn't come up with that. That's great. It's fine. You didn't have to. We came up with it for you. And I'm Ashley. I'm the Gen Z. So excited to well, be here. What's this episode going to be about? Well, because so we're this is great. So, Josh, I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit further. Other than uh, you know, you are here because of uh, uh, some special expertise and knowledge that you have that you shared with me recently on a podcast that I thought was absolutely perfect. Sure. And so, you were kind enough uh, to accept an invite to let us take even more of your time and talk about. But I, I don't want to steal your thunder because you do such a better job of explaining it than I can. So. <laughs> Go, go ahead. And look, you can introduce yourself a little further uh, than, than okay. just your uh, Zennial. Is that what yeah, we're Yeah, Zennial. It's, uh, it's an X millennial. It's millennial with a Z. It's a thing. And, uh, so that's what it was. Yeah. So I'm, I'm Josh Hammonds. And so I've been I've been professoring for quite some time. And so I think 2003 or so I was in graduate school. And that was my first like official standalone course I had as a graduate student teaching um, and then I uh, got my PhD in 2009 in the field of communication, and I specialize in organizational communication and interpersonal communication. So a lot of social psychology of human interaction that happens in the workplace. And I've been teaching college students since about 2000, 2003. And so I've seen right at the millennial uh, line all the way now through uh, COVID and Gen Z. And so I'm raising some Gen Alphas. And so I feel like, you know, no, even though I'm getting older, my audience is still sort of 18 to 21 year old. So I've really seen the, the trajectory and the progression of elder millennial to the younger millennial to the to now I have all Gen Z in, in the classroom. And so it's fascinating looking at some of these trends. And so I, I think I think this fits really well to have this conversation uh, within this context with you all today. So I appreciate being on here. Now, how much you subscribe to all the cliches? I mean, do you buy into these? I mean, we, we have fun yeah, with them on this show. Right. So being, you, you knew what you were getting into I, a little bit today. I but so. uh, I mean, but but there's a lot of truth to 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 what we joke he about. Loves his generation of cliches. It is. And so and so yeah, like I would never like I'm I'm against like stereotyping and categorizing an entire group. What I don't care what that group is. There's nuances in that group, right? And so you can talk about the the nuances of what happens if you're millennial in a metropolitan area and what part of the country versus a rural area. And so but I do think that there are sociocultural factors that influence and create trends and patterns in generations. So you talk about the, you know, the World War II shifted the mindset 
after World War II. And then we talk about the millennial you know, movement of the 9-11 movement. When 9-11 happened, that created a different mindset. People started parenting a little bit different. People started talking to each other a little bit different. So there are these massive sort of geo-cultural movements that happen that shift the mindset that even if you are have a different personality that might not fit millennial, there is something in the water there that is happening with technology being invented, certain platforms that we use to communication. To say that that doesn't shape our understanding of reality at least a little bit to, to at least explain trends, I think that's naive to say that as well. So there's certainly observable trends in these generational differences, but like at the same time, always always open palmed discussions as I described, you know, groups of people for sure. And we like we like to have fun with it, of course, <laughs> on here because we do have to all work together, right? I mean, we we come from different perspectives, different backgrounds, and I think you you said it much better than we ever do that uh, the you're an individual, but a lot of outside influences and what's going on in the world shapes you. And technology, I, we we always seem to end up talking about that because it's been such a big factor how. Peter grew up with it was different than what Ashley's grown up with and vastly different than, of course, what, what I grew up with, uh, which was to say not not much in way of technology. So uh, would, would you where do you rank that as as a factor in, um, in all of these generational shifts? Just like technology in general or I. Yeah, I don't I, I think for for to understand it. It only works. Technology is only an influential factor if it affects the way that we absorb and consume media and information, but then also the platforms that we use to express ourselves and communicate. So, I mean, I'm I am certain that when we start talking about Gen Alpha, we're going to have to talk about the TikTok effect that happened and <laughs> FaceTiming during COVID and things like this. And so each new kind of invention and technological integration is going to shift and change mindsets for sure is if it's if it's affecting the way that we communicate with each other it's going to affect our mindset and our and the shaping of our realities like pete said we always end up back here like we're always like the advent of like the digital age and just you know yeah. millennial that like how could that not like social media came about for me my general like millennials like i was like there with myspace and facebook and like that profoundly changed it i mean it's still changing things like going like you said TikTok. like so that sort of thing is you can't not be affected <laughs> It's correct. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the self. Yeah. I mean, I remember the day I got my cell phone. People younger than me don't. They're like, I don't know when it was. Was I six? Was I eight? I don't remember how old, but I remember in college. My, it was like it was this handing of the baton. You know, it's like this yeah. is now a device that yeah, you're new you that you have. That was <laughs> the brick. candy bar. Yes. <laughs> I remember being at uh, at a dinner with a lot of um, my daughter, who's now 23, her classmates, her parents, their, their parents were all there. And I was told by one of the parents that I was doing a, my daughter a disservice because she was the last one in the class you know, to have a cell phone. And this was oh, sixth grade. So that's oh. where I kind of draw the line and say, no, no, my kids weren't getting cell phones until they were in in sixth grade that like yeah. after that, I know it was after that, but um, that probably even seems somewhat dated at this point. Yeah. Right. I mean, you're old yeah. at that point. Not now. Oh, yeah. my, my daughter who's nine, she still will say, dad, you didn't even have cell phones when you were born. How could you put like, that's still the dig she uses. Like for whatever reason, that's the phrase <laughs> she wants to hold on to. And like, I think about that. I'm like, I guess that's antiquated when you say it out loud like that with some heat behind it, I guess. So, yeah, you're so old. Um, <laughs> So today we're going to talk about your new course that uh, I was exposed to from, from everything you shared with me recently on burnout. And we know that that is such an important thing uh, in today's world. I mean, there's pressure coming from everywhere. I mean, we you know, don't have time, nor should we probably get into the events of, of the past couple of days that everyone is aware of at this point going on in the Middle East. But I mean, there's pressure coming from all sides. Yeah. And we don't want to add to it at work, of course. Uh, we'd rather enjoy ourselves during the day. We'd rather find fulfillment, but that's easier said than done a lot of times. So I thought we'd go through the four stages or the four types of burnout. Sure. Look at those from a different, you know, by generation, how we think each generation reacts to um, to these different, different things. So 
Yeah. Well, why don't you just kick us off with uh, with explaining what is burnout, and then we'll get into the different types. I love it. I think I think that's great. Uh, yeah. So my my interest in burnout didn't come until until right in the middle of the pandemic, and people started talking about it so much that I said, "All right, it's time to dive deep into this research." Right. I, I've looked at organizations and communication and all that, but I never really sunk my teeth into what burnout is. But everyone's just using it. I mean, I feel like you you turn to the left and somebody's saying, "Oh, I'm burned out about this. I'm burned out about this," and so diving to the research, we, we know that it's a term that Christina Maslach in 1982 and had a group of researchers really investigate what is actual workplace burnout? What's the definition of it? And then how do we know the different kinds and different types? And so she, she looked at this and, and it was really very much defined as this idea that burnout is a, a syndrome that involves experiences of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization is what she talked about, and reduced self-accomplishment while at work. So you really have these different distinct facets that are happening. And so diving deep into this, I was able to really identify four different kinds of burnout, which have different causes, but then also different remedies, depending on where you're at. So the first kind is this idea of physical burnout. And that's what we saw a lot during the pandemic, especially when people started doing Zoom meetings back to back. There was one Microsoft study that I post on LinkedIn that got quite famous, uh, got a lot of hits from it. But it was this idea that we are doing Zoom meetings back to back to back, and it's literally frying our, our brain wavelengths. And, and we were we were creating so much stress from just constantly being on Zoom of these back-to-back -back meetings. And so that's the first kind of burnout, which is I'm just physically exhausted. I gotta ch I gotta take a break. I gotta go for a walk somewhere. And, and the priorities behind that are like, you need rest, you need to reprioritize your boundaries, and you need to probably say no to at least two or three meetings <laughs> a day if that's what's happening to you, right? So that's physical burnout. But then the second kind of burnout, which, which is different than, than physical burnout, is called mental burnout. And this is where you have a lack of meaning or lack of purpose in your role. So, so you're sitting around your job and you're going, I don't know if I want to be an accountant anymore. I don't, I don't know if I want to be a teacher anymore. What, why does it matter? I, I, I've lost the meaning behind my work. And, and in that search for meaning, you're actually burning out trying to find what it is that you're supposed to do. Um, a, a lot of people had a lack of meaning because they really weren't they didn't really know what they were supposed to do during the pandemic. They Things got added to them. Their job shifted so much because now we're doing online stuff or we're doing remote work that they lost the purpose and the meaning behind that. So that's a, that's mental burnout where you have a lack of purpose or a lack of meaning. And then the third kind of burnout, which I think is probably the scariest. This one is this one's the red flag burnout for me if I hear people talk about this. But this is attitude burnout. And this is where you develop some cynical, toxic feelings towards your work, right? And this actually stems from a lack of recognition and a, and a lack of value, uh, a lack of communication in the value that should be communicated to you, but it's not. So, so you're not being recognized at work anymore. You're not being valued, uh, both financially, right? With with I'm not being compensated for my work, but but even more than that, intrinsically, that that nobody in a while has told you, wow, what you do really matters. And this is really great, the value that you bring to this team. And so when that's not happening for a long time, you develop these, these, these cynical attitudes. And so you might feel like what you're doing has a lot of meaning and purpose. And you might not even be tired, but you're cynical now because you're not getting the recognition that you deserve. So that's attitudinal burnout. And then, and then the fourth kind of burnout we see a lot, specifically with tech evolution and AI boom, is a skill burnout where you, you feel that you have inadequacies in your skill set to keep up with the demands of a fast growing, changing landscape of your work. So uh, you no longer know how to use a particular program or I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do here. And so you've got all these demands and you've got new programs and we're changing over the system, but it's growing faster than I have a chance to even catch up with. And I'm burning out because I haven't taken a break and learned this system or wrapped my head around it to do it. And so you see that in, in, in executives, in, in the tech industry, and in people that are trying to keep up with these sorts of demands. So that's that's skill burnout. So you got the four. You got the physical, which is which is the physical tiredness burnout, but then mental burnout, which is a lack of meaning and purpose, attitudinal burnout, which is cynicism, and I'm, I'm developing these toxic feelings and having these sidebar conversations with my, <laughs> my coworkers because I can't stand it here. And then you've got the skill burnout, which is the fourth. So identifying those and, and using assessments to figure out those can really help people quench specific kinds of burnout 
and, and hopefully get them in a place where they can recreate that purpose or get healed from their attitude. Or maybe it's time to go looking, go look elsewhere. And, and maybe another career is calling your name and it's time to go job hunting again. Those are your four. Oh, Pete, uh -oh. you're muted. I didn't want to interrupt all that. <laughs> that, that, that was such a great explanation and so much to absorb. So we need to break that down. We need to break that down, period. But Ashley, how surprised are you to hear that burnout is so much more than just, I think, what we typically associate it with, which is just kind of maybe even hard to define or quantify prior to that explanation that you gave is just, I'm just, I'm just exhausted right? Mentally exhausted. I think that's what I historically would have would have associated it with. I thought there was just one type and this whole time I thought it was just the toxic one, especially with TikTok. You see, yeah. you know, toxic workplace all over the place. Everyone's burnt out. No one wants to work a nine to five. Everyone's hating on it. So I didn't know that there were that many and it all makes so much sense now. Yeah. When you bring it down like that, it's it's clear like there they are differences. But yeah, number three, where People aren't getting recognized, and then they're going and complaining to other people and kind of infecting them with their toxicity. Right. That's the kind that I guess I traditionally associate yeah. with saying burnout. Yeah. Right. And that's that's why I call it sort of the red flag one. That because that's the one we hear the most. That's one that's expressed the most. When when a teacher who's been teaching for 20 years wakes up and says, you know what, I want more money. And I don't know if if this matters as much as it did when I first started, I think I can still make a difference and make more money. And I'm going to exit stage left and go to this industry. You don't hear about that burnout, right? That one doesn't get aired out. The dirty laundry doesn't get waved and the TikTok doesn't go viral. It's just like, now I'm a realtor and I'm helping people find homes instead of education and I'm doubling my money. And that's how I fixed my burnout, right? And so that sort of, you know, purpose burnout or meaning burnout that you find. So, yeah. So let's let's get into it uh, from a generational standpoint mm -hmm. by by type, if we can. So physical burnout. Um, I, here, let me just throw this out there. I think the 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 older you are, the less prone to feeling that you might be, or the more accepting of that you mm -hmm. are. Right where I expect that. Yeah, to, I expect to feel physical burnout uh, from my job. Doesn't mean that it's something that, that that we want or or should accept. I just think the older you are, you generationally, uh, the more prone you are to just yeah you know, think that's just part of the deal. You, you've just been beaten down over the years. They're like, well, I guess I'm just expected to be in a, meetings for ten hours. <laughs> well, no, no, I think life is is gotten progressively easier just through throughout human history. But even through our lifetimes where my parents had it harder than I did, when my children had, had it easier than I do, just with physical comfort, just take, I mean, here we are with technology already, right? But just something as the convenience of having the entire history of the world at your fingertips on your phone, right? And, and every bit of information, there's no, you, you just, things come at, come easily now, a lot more easily than they used to. So I think life is easier and, and that sort of translates into um, not being as physically tough as, as prior generations. <laughs> you would say that. It, it could. It, I think it could be that. I think that. I think there's some of that there. I, I also wonder if an older generation understood the cl the clocking in and clocking out world, and and we talk about work life balance. Well, that that term has been like debunked. It's now work life integration. That like you're working from home and and homing from work and. And all the and so the boundaries end up getting blurred a little bit more. That that you'll find a, a a millennial or a Gen Z at a tech company working way into the night on a particular project because the client needs this and it's Sprint Week and we got to hurry, 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 hurry up. And so the pacing is more intermittent. So if you do a back to back to back to back on Monday for eight hours, but you still know that you at 11 p.m. you're gonna have to clock back in and finish this PowerPoint deck, and then you're gonna have to do this. So I wonder if they're just more prone to this idea, like this is not sustainable. Whereas an older generation, when they did clock out, like they unplug and they they know how to unplug. And and maybe the younger generation's like, what do you mean unplug? We're always connected. Well, there's no there is no unplugging. We're, I'm always kind of at work, and if my boss pings me at any time on Slack for any reason, I, I got a I got another thirty minutes that I got to put into this to to get you know to get ahead of this. That's a good point. I mean, I've talked to people older people than older than me who 
are like, I won't, you know, I don't have X on my phone or I don't have this because it's like when I'm working, I'm working when I'm not working, I'm, I'm not working. And I mean, it's, it's a really big remote thing. Like mm -hmm. having, getting notifications, like you said, I, I get notifications on Slack all the time yeah. um, from certain people on, on this call. Um, but uh, people who are unable to, to differentiate that and they're like, I got to answer it right now. Or, you know, right. it's always in the back of their mind. I feel like that, that's probably a common thing with with millennials and, and maybe Gen Z. And that's why you're like, we have higher anxiety than it is because you can't unplug. You're always like, right. I can't get away from it. You know, it's, 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 it's a thing. It is, it is a thing. I'll acknowledge that. What, what creates more anxiety though, knowing what the message is and choosing mm -hmm. not to react or ignore, or not knowing if you have messages, right. right? Like I, the latter drives me crazy. Yeah. And that's just my, I, but I think that's more of a personality type than anything else. Like I, mm. I'm not someone who, even though I should for efficiency's sake, not look at email for four hours at a time, right? I mean, everything you read says that's a great way to be efficient and get more work done. And, uh, and objectively, I completely buy it. I just can't put it into practice, right? right? Yeah, so- I mean, so you get any, so you know, it's, you're the, you know, you're sitting at dinner and you get a Slack message about, hey, we got to handle X, Y, and Z tomorrow, or you get an email you're you're thinking about, it. even if it's not something important. And I, I agree, I think it's a personality type, but you're you're in the back of your mind, you're like, okay, well, like now I got to deal with this thing in the morning, and it's you know, it's eating away, even though you're doing something completely different. Maybe it's like a subconscious thing. I think that's a common. I just uh, because I yeah. send a message while you're eating dinner doesn't mean you have to read it. I'm, I'm uh, pretty right. mute to it because I'm, I'm always on and off. Someone like, on I, this call, I think. Uh, <laughs> let's see. It's, well, it's not. It's not Josh. <laughs> I don't think it was <laughs> well, luckily, so, I'm. I'm. Uh, I, I. I. You know, play video games or whatever. So I'm used to being on my computer a lot. So I. I. I and I find that that's a kind of a, a trend. Is people. Uh, younger generation people who spend a lot of time connected yeah. maybe they're better at that i don't not better but they're more used to that like multitasking so like i don't get really burnt out from being on a lot of meetings it is exhausting you know it can be exhausting right. for, there's a lot of them but i think that that maybe that tolerance is it varies from person to person right and 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 then you've got to look at the other type so if i'm getting great meaning and purpose I'm valued and being compensated well, and I feel like I've got the skill set skill set for my job. I, I can do a sprint week, right? I can I can put in. Oh, I put in 58 hours this week, but wow! Look at the value I added. Look at the you know. Look at how much impact this made. This means a lot to me, right? And so, yeah, your work you know, habits can go yeah. a long way with that. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think it's important to continue to tie that into to the conversation that if if it doesn't feel like work. Or if you enjoy what you're doing and you're choosing willingly, you know, and excited to do it, how much of, does that come into play in all this, Josh? Where, uh, you know, by doing something you're forced to do, I would say you'd be a lot more apt to to feel ill effects yeah. across the board. Yeah. If you're not getting the, yeah, I, I think I go back to that balance. If you're not getting the value and you're not finding the meaning or the purpose and you're exhausted now now you're burning now you've got three wicks <laughs> burning but if you can keep that in check right if i've these are things that i've been told to do but i love doing them i get great meaning from it you're compensating me super well what i think i'm worth and i'm feeling like this is a great value and a match to my skill set even if you told me to do it those other two categories intrinsically drive me to also want to do that Understood. All right. So, Michelle, let us know what you mean by double edged sword, because uh, we, yeah, yeah. we we've been talking about lots of different things. We'd love for you to weigh in. Ashley, where are you with physical burnout? Where? Come on. Come on, Gen, uh, Gen Z or weigh in. Um, I mean, I feel like I feel like Gen X would be more physical, physically burnt out, especially because of technology, because there's so much technology coming out. And again, it's some are more advanced in technology than others some are hopping on the train quicker but like let's just say with like ai or yep. you know having to hop on zoom meetings all of a sudden again bringing back like the pandemic yeah um they had to learn how to install everything on their computers and had to learn how to like do all of that on their own without the help of anybody else so physically i mean i feel like a lot, especially during the pandemic gen x is probably burnt out 
Yeah. Well, and the skill, the, like the skill burnout, this idea. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. That's kind of like two of them together. Yeah, let's, let's yeah get, it's like a mix. Let's get to that in a minute. It, 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 um, you know, Daniel weighed in and say, you know, not easy when you unplug, truly unplug. It's hard. It's impossible right now, isn't it? I mean, can you really unplug? I, you have to be extremely disciplined to do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I feel like um, even if I'm like on vacation or yeah. like the other day I was, you know, helping my sister find a wedding dress. And then I got a notification. I was like, I need to look at this. Like, I have to look at this. I can't put it aside because I just, I need to know what's going on and yep. like be in the loop so I don't get left behind. But Absolutely. all right. So Josh, we'll, we, we need to tap into you while, while we have the chance on this mm -hmm. from a leadership standpoint, is that a bad idea? You know, like Peter said, sending you, you know, if you get a message at 7 oh. PM, yeah. um, the leader doesn't necessarily expect you to stop what you're doing and respond. Right. They're just sending the message. Get it off your head. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right? Yeah. Just, and so yeah. I've, I've dealt with so many leaders this way. There's there's two things. And what they'll say is like, oh, no, no, you don't have to respond. But if I can get this off my plate, that's great. There's a reason that that Gmail and other people have timed responses. So write that email and then have it send their inbox at 8.01 a.m. tomorrow morning. If it doesn't need to be responded to now, you can put the delayed setting and and send that off. That will. And I don't even think leaders know that that is there. It's like, well, that's another skill that they have to learn. That's a button I have to figure out, right? But But if you can do that, you, I don't care how many times you say you don't need to send me this back at 2 a.m. This is just how I work. Actions speak louder than words. And so if that is your attitude and those are your nonverbals and someday I want your job, then I guess I do have to do that no matter how many times you have to say, oh, don't worry about it. I'm just getting off my plate. Your actions are speaking louder. And, and we will subconsciously try to mirror the same behaviors as our leaders if we in fact want a leadership position. And the latest research says that 91% of all millennials that are currently in the workforce believe and aspire to a leadership position at some point in their life. And that's like only less than 10% are like, I'm fine being an individual contributor. 90% are like, oh no, no, I'll have your job soon at some point, maybe not now, maybe. And so we're constant, millennials are constantly thinking about, well, if this is what we're supposed to do, then, then, I, then I need to do this back to you, right? Um, the only other thing I would add to this is, you know, just like you were saying of the anxiety, if you're on vacation or doing something, I, I've heard from so many people say, I am more anxious thinking that I might get a notification when my notifications are silent than actually having it in my pocket and getting the vibration and going, okay, I, I'd rather just respond to this now than thinking I could have 35 missed messages, even though it's my day off, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and have 30. I can't deal with that anxiety. So I'm just going to leave it on. And so again, that's not their leader's fault, but it's good for the leader to know that this is going through the mind of a lot of the people that you're leading. All right. Well, this is good for me to hear because I'm guilty across the board of sending messages, nights, weekends, early mornings, but it's because that's when it's on my mind. Correct. And, it, and it's not because I expect it to be responded to. And yes, I am aware of that button, even though at my advanced right. age, Ashley, it's hard to track down, you know, how to navigate these things. But I, I was able to, to figure that out. I just don't use it right. because in my mind, and this is where communication breakdown is occurring from what you just said. I, I don't assume you, I, I don't expect you to respond to it right away. I'm just, it's when I'm sending the message. So, and I'm me who, you know? but yeah, but I don't, I don't think email is like an instant messaging app, right? right. Where I, in fact, wish I could get rid of email altogether. Um, yeah. But so when I send an email, it's, hey, get to it when you get to it. If I need you right away, I'd call you. Yeah. I feel like it also, I could see that too, because I'm like a very forgetful person. And if I don't tell someone what I have to like, like if I'm asking them to do something and I need them to do it, like, let's just say Monday, I need to tell them like now or else I'm going to forget. So I could see that too. Yeah. I feel like it's a, it's a balance. I mean, I, as, as, as funny as I'd rather get like, you know, like Slack messages that are like, Hey, you know, this, and I can follow along and I can kind of just glance at it. I, I treat it kind of like a text message. Yeah. Whereas e emails, I'm like, all right, now they're, they're, they're building up. I got to go in, check my emails. And, and I, it kind of seems like, you know, the people I know that that's where, uh, that's where like the Sunday scaries come from. They're like, Oh, I haven't checked my email all weekend and what's waiting for me on Monday morning. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to start and get kind of there. I'll tell you, the only thing that broke me from that is working at a tech firm 
with global team members across mm-hmm. different time zones, 100% remote asynchronous communication. So we'd have a product, we'd have a, four of us be on a slide deck. One one lived in Europe. I was in I was on East Coast. We had a West Coast, and we had someone from Hawaii. So it was almost there was a 35 minute window <laughs> in the day where all of us would be on. Everything else would be like, okay, Chelsea finished her part. And uh, I see where she has this and it's all time stamped. And okay, I'm going to get, I'm probably not going to clock in until 9 a.m. Eastern time. Then I'm going to work till two on this. So you can expect my comments from there. And there was never an urgency to respond because it was a living document we were constantly working on. But that takes a lot of psychological and cultural reshaping, which I think it's worth it if you're a team leader of a hybrid workforce. But yeah, that's a lot of expectation conversations. Absolutely. And so much of it is dependent on the type of work you're doing. Right. I mean, there's an exchange that we've been having on Slack uh, for the past couple hours with our developers where nothing would progress if we weren't able to respond right away. If this was taking place in the middle of the night while we were sleeping, a day would go by and we wouldn't make any progress because it requires a lot of back and forth. And I, I, I find that to be a barrier to not responding sooner than later. That that's the one thing I just can't get away from because it's it's you know there's there's so much to do right there's so much progress that needs to happen and you have to keep up. Well said. Maybe not the healthiest, right? Like because that's what we're we're learning through all this. So let, let's get into the mental um, yeah, into the mental aspect of it because that is something that uh, you touched on it briefly, but I think this is where you're. Microsoft study comes into play yeah. a little bit more. So could you could you share a few thoughts on that? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, the, the mental, this is you mentally have checked out that I no longer see the meaning or the purpose in, in my role. And some of that is like you woke up, a pandemic shook you up. You started asking big questions like, why does it all matter? And you've decided to make a career change. And so we saw a lot of people that that exited stage left during the pandemic. I A good chunk of those were changing industries. They were teachers going into tech. These were people in the tech industry going into real estate, right? And so you had this do do of people going, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. It isn't even about necessarily my, my manager or or this company. I don't know if I want this industry anymore. But a lot of the mental shakeup is just sort of like, why does it matter? And and what am I doing? And and this is where I think Gen Z shines, because so much of what drives Gen Z is impact. Like if what I'm doing does not have, if I can't see the direct influence or impact that I'm having on the world, the global significance of it, I don't want to just count beans for money, right? I would rather take a pay cut and join a career, join an organization that is doing something with impact. And I can actually see my effects on that impact. And so that's really what I want to do. And so that's, that's something that I've had to educate leaders on. If you're not tying their role to the overall mission or vision of the organization and seeing how that impact is playing out and showing them the meaning and the purpose behind their role, they're going to get disengaged very quickly. And they will search for something until they feel satisfied in that way. So that is one trend I have seen with with the Gen Z. So how much of that do we think is impacted from one generation to the next? Where when you talk purpose, meaning, that's something that has come uh, up a whole lot more over the last 10 years than it did 20, 30 years ago. Yes. Yes. Tell me why. (laughs) <laughs> Not coming from me, so these guys are going to have to tell you why, right? They're the ones uh, bringing this forward. Got, I can re- I can tell you what the theory says, but I want to hear from you all. Yeah, Ashley, what do you? So you, I mean, you got you're the Gen Z, and we we brought this up multiple times about how you know this is the they they care about the mission, and I mean, I I think it's somewhat with millennials, but definitely Gen Z is the 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 ones carrying it. I think it's again where the participation trophy comes in. We've talked about the participation trophy before, and maybe we seek so much more because we want to be like recognized for our work. Because again, we're so used to being rewarded and getting that like good feeling that comes from it. But it also comes from the millennials. I feel like you guys also, you know, grew up with that whole participation trophy effect. I think it's more like the... uh... It's like the, you know, it's the social media aspect of it. That's how I kind of see, like, you can see other people all around the world. It's not like you're just in your bubble 
and you're seeing, you know, somebody over on the other side of the country doing all these cool things and mm-hmm. what they, you know, they, they're really connected to, you know, either politics or social, you know, whatever. And so you're like, I want to do that. I want, I want to feel, uh, you know, that engagement that what I'm doing matters and yeah. Yeah. being able to tie that back to yourself where, like you said, I, could I, could I count beans for a hundred thousand dollars or could I, or, or could I do something that I think really matters and maybe make kind of $70,000, yeah. some, some significant pay cut. And I'm like, I would rather take the lower paying one because at the end of the day, I feel like what I do, what I do matters. And it's not just like, yeah. who cares, you know? And I think some of it, you know, I think it started with, it started with Gen X with like the mid eighties and live aid, but it really got kicking. I think when gap started the red campaign with you two, and it was like, so much of what you your genes go to this, you know, outlet, this humanitarian philanthropic outlet. And you're like, oh, that's then I'm going to give my money to this person. Right. And so it, it kind of coincided a little bit with <laughs> corporate greed gets exposed, but we're not all greedy. We're giving some of our money to good things. And it was like, that's what I want. So there's there was this mission focused movement that happened right at the millennial movement. And now it's like, you know, when you go on Amazon, you can pick which company you would like your proceeds to go to and targets giving to the school. And so you see a lot of collaborations with companies saying, how much are we giving back and, and what are we giving forward? So people want to be part of a, a social movement, a mission. And and yeah. So you're a new in your career. Say you're a Gen Z person. Say you're a software developer and you work at random I don't know, IBM. You work at IBM and you're just a random entry level developer. Like your job, yes, you are a cog in the machine. Like you are not the person who is, your job is not making a huge difference in the company and that's okay. Like, so how do you, I guess, how do, how does a young person kind of justify that and not get the, you know, burnout of like, does my job matter? Because I am just, I'm, a, I'm not the CEO of the company. I work at a huge company. I'm just a random person in a random department. And yeah, my job, I guess, helps out I, the department as a whole. But I think it's unrealistic expectations and it doesn't represent the, the masses as a whole. So, you know, just take take what has happened with Disney fighting with our governor over uh, in Florida here where we were based over the past year and a half. That's divisive at at. at at best, right? But you have employees. I mean, if you look at any pol- anything political right now in our country, it's about a 50-50 split, right? For all intents and purposes, left, right, conservative, liberal, whatever it is. So to take that stance, you're consciously alienating half of the employees one way or the other. It doesn't matter which way. You're, and so I guess my perspective on it is those things should be wherever possible removed from the work situation because inevitably you're going to uh, you know, alienate half the half the individuals and I think that it's it's easier to just you know to not expect social justice a stance on social justice from your employer sure yeah and I it, yeah to me I still just go back to like what is the mission of the organization there, there are nonprofits there's religious organizations that are going no in, in our fundamentals this is our mission and and in being this mission we might have to be exclusionary to other missions because we are laser focused on this mission and providing this thing and then everything else either gets you know secondary or, or whatnot and so if people know that and that mission is clear and they have people that want to rally around that and be involved in that mission then it it fits and it works and that's what sort of works would you, yeah, where, where do you would you for you know, to from a leadership standpoint do you think it's a good idea for leaders to take a, a stance on on hot topics? I'm not asking you. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, if you're if you're creating a product that you want to sell to every human being on the planet to use that product and then you want to make a political statement. And like, I don't know if that works great for revenue. Right. Necessarily. Right. I mean, there's 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 competing goals and competing visions that happen when you make, you know, either political statements, religious statements, you know, exclusionary statements for sure. But. I guess if your mission, if the part of the mission of the organization coincides with those beliefs, then that's that's another story. And those are that's where you have nonprofit and protected groups and free, you know, freedom of religion and all that sort of stuff. Is there even yeah. a way to um, to like avoid that? I mean, so that that type of burnout of being like my job doesn't matter. I, does does it like is there a way to even avoid that, or is it just you gotta help those people move on and not? So I, I think that's a great question because it's like. I, you know, we, I hired somebody and they woke up six like months. They don't later. like this job anymore. Like, how do I stop that? 
right? And so I, I, I always tell leaders, I said, you, you have some options because one of the reasons why they have a lack of meaning might be because they have a lack of clarity. And so a lot of times if you've, if, if you hired me to do this thing and now I'm doing 17 more things, now, now I don't know what I'm doing. You hired me to be a data analyst, but now I'm putting together PowerPoint slides and I'm communicating with customers. And I, I never wanted to do that. I, I loved my numbers and I was a strategist and, and, and I would get in my Excel spreadsheet and, oh, the world would make sense, right? Let's say that's who they are. And now I'm doing all these other things because you fired half of our team and I got to pick up their slack. And now I don't have meaning or purpose anymore because I'm spending most of my time talking to customers and that's not what you hired me to do. So having these, like, if the scope has creeped too much, having these conversations to reel in what your role clarity is and then say, this is what you hired me to do. I want to do that again and want to do it really well. And now the clarity is, ha, aha, right? These aha moments and, and you can work in that. And now I have meaning and purpose again. And so you, I think you can save and reroute people that have lost meaning if the meaning that was lost is due to role ambiguity. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. In, in explaining, you know, how right. here's your role and here's how your, you know, your role type right. contributes to the bigger picture type of thing. But if I don't ever want to teach anymore <laughs> and you've hired me as a teacher, it's like, okay, well, we need to have an exit plan and figure out this, how to yeah. do this smoothly and, and, you know, those sorts of things. So before we move on to attitude, do, do we think that there's a generational impact back there or, or do you, I, I would say that the younger generations look for more purpose and meaning right from the job than you know, yep. baby boomers, even bleeding yep. into Gen X. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree with that. It's not, it, you know, it seems like the, you know, older generations, people, like you said, a job is just a job. And now it's like, well, my, my career is part of my identity. So I want to feel yeah. good about my identity. Right. So I want to feel like my job matters to some bigger yeah. thing. The other thing and I would be cautious about when we talk about generational things is, is it a generation distinction or is it an age stage distinction? Yeah. So mm -hmm. did, does every 28 year old struggle with meaning back in the 1940s all the way till now? And that when you're 58, it's not so much that I'm questioning the meaning of my job, but I'm getting so much meaning and purpose from maybe my social network, my family. If I have a family, maybe a family, maybe I've got other networks, other groups I'm established in the community. So when I come to work, it is just a job and I don't read in. I don't I don't crave the meaning and purpose because I have so much of that satisfied in these other spheres of my life. So it's That's a 28 year old thing. It's not a Gen Z thing. It's just a, an age and stage. You're still looking to find that self-actualization where you are now. Right. That makes a lot of sense. I, I think that I think that's probably a big a big component of it. Um, just real quick, thanks for the comment, uh, Dan Joseph. That uh, yeah, I, 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 we've we've mentioned COVID a few times, and I, I I don't know that there was anyone who didn't struggle with different kinds of feelings and and what to experience. You know, I know there's a lot of people who were guilty that they enjoyed the time of you know, being at home, spending more time with their family away from the office. Obviously, there was a lot of you know, so much uh, heartbreak going on during that time. So that, if anything, I mean, we have enough pressure coming at us and now we had this just add to it. So Josh, should that just make things you know, a whole lot worse collectively? Just the pandemic in general or yeah. Well, I mean, for, yeah. for burnout, I mean, specifically, yeah, we know the pandemic was bad, but <laughs> for burnout in particular. Yeah, I, I think the pan the pandemic shook some things up. I think, I think a lot of the burnout research was this idea of um, just the back-to-back -back Zooms working from home in a brand new sort of environment. And so there was a lot of burnout with that. But the big philosophical questions on meaning and purpose, I think, poured gasoline onto people that were already on the fence about whether this was the right job. And then they're going, oh, oh boy. I mean, the, the number of divorces that year, the number of homes that were sold that year, the number of job changes that happened in 2020, 2021. I mean, that... A lot of people were burned out in a lot of things, but sort of looking at that. But um, yeah, I, I also feel, and this, is, uh, this isn't this is a commonly held belief, but I also feel like there is something about working with people in their presence that excites and energizes us in a way that we get energy from being face-to-face -face and interacting with people. And when we were in that pandemic, it wasn't so much that we were burned out as much as we never really got human jolts like we normally do. Mm -hmm. Like nobody, nobody frustrated us, made us laugh, 
said something hilarious at the office, gossiped with me, right? We didn't get those like normal endorphin kicks that kind of make us feel alive. And everyone sort of had this lethargic kind of thing. And I think we were mistaking burnout or at least conflating burnout with other kinds of emotional experiences that, that we were having in, in some ways. But yeah, we certainly started using the, the B word burnout any chance we could get when we were feeling anything of that effect. Makes sense. All right. Yeah. Attitude. Now, oh, boy. now we're, now we're in millennial land, right? <laughs> we have to be. Huh? Finally. Oh, <laughs> millennial. <laughs> I mean, Ashley, Maybe. come on. You, you've been, you've been way too you know, kind with this. You, you, you said the, the rec recognition word, right? Yeah, that to yeah. me, I mm -hmm. need to be recognized. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that is something that now I have to, pause a little bit and think, okay, is it where we are, you know, stage in life, stage in career, or is it generational? And I do think this is a big generational shift where um, that need to be, have the pat on the back to, you know, to be recognized is, is, this uh, is greater growth? today than it used well, there to be. There could be monetary recognition too. Recognition is not just yeah. being like, you could be right. Just paid a lot. And I'm like, okay, great. You're recognizing me that way. But is that enough, right? Is, is that enough? Or does, does there have to be more uh, today? Uh, I, I think it kind of goes into like, like the last one we were talking about where people want to feel like their, their job matters. So yeah, I, I, it, I think it is pretty common that people want some sort of recognition outside of, of if you, if you're paid really well, then maybe your tolerance is higher, but you still want to, you know, you feel like you're the best in your department or you did contribute some project or, or whatever. Like, I, I think if you're, if you're not paid great, then it's got to be made up for in some other way. And maybe that's a millennial thing. Maybe that's a, anybody in the, you know, who's kind of come of age in the digital. So I kind of lump millennials and Gen Z and into right. that, that type of thing. Like you got to feel like your employer at least values you. Yeah. I don't think that's a uncommon. Yeah. And, and I think, I think that there is a generational thing, this idea of oh, patience isn't the right word, but, but there's an expectation that I will, that I will rise among the ranks quicker, right? With the, 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 the newer generation, and I would include myself in this, things happen quicker at a quicker pace. We, we spend 18 months to two years at a job and then we jump to another job and then we jump to another job. And so recognition is the mechanism that helps us determine, am, am, I, am I going up? Am I going to get promoted? Am I going to do those things? And so the monetary works, right? But that's also in a line with promotion. And so am I having career growth plan conversations. And if I recognize you, I'm probably also saying, you know, at this rate, you're doing so well, I could see you moving to this way and this way in a couple of months or in a couple of weeks or, or whatever it is. And so I think that recognition goes along with growth and I'm moving up and that's like the biggest sign of it. And so I think yeah. those two conflated. That's really good. Yeah. The, the movement aspect of it is like feeling like you're going somewhere, right. feeling like you've got a clear path and you're like, even if it's just a little bit, I'm doing a little bit better today than I was yeah. yesterday. And I'm not stagnant. That's yeah. like Tell me I'm not going to be in this chair five years from now doing this exact yeah. same thing. That would make me feel claustrophobic. Yeah. And but, that could but, be but, at, but historically, if you look at someone who worked for a company for 30 years and got the gold watch and the whole thing, they expected to be in the chair for five years. Correct. And, and now you tell that to someone in their twenties, they're, they think you're crazy. Right. Uh, no one wants to do anything for five years, let alone three years, Right. sometimes two. And I have a, a lot of opinions on that based on how I know hiring happens. And we could talk about job hopping, which we talk about a lot um, in, in our world of Zen gig. And when hiring managers see that you haven't been somewhere very long, right? That is a factor, whether it should be yeah. or not, whether you've, you want it to be or not, it is irrelevant. We know that it is. So how do you reconcile that? The need to, st to stay and achieve versus the desire to evolve and, and do something differently. Um, I don't, I, I mean, it's a real struggle. I don't have a great answer to it yeah. because I see both sides of it. I know. I, you know, uh, I spent a lot of time in the tech sector lately. And, and there's, I think there's a reason why so many of those just graduating college gravitate towards the SaaS companies and the tech companies. I think it's, I think it fits there. Like I'm not doing just one thing, right? The startup culture, but then also like 
three years in the life of a brand new tech company is like 50 years in, a, in, a, in another organization. And so they're, I think they're drawn to that, attracted to that and that type of growth, right? That if you're in the same place in two years from now, you've done something wrong. And so there is an expectation that, and this is clear in, in the research, that if you want to create a more engaged employee experience that, that employees, the brand new, lead, you know, brand new uh, hires are experiencing, that there needs to be consistent feedback on a continual basis. And so telling that to leaders who may not be used to that, I'm like, you've got to give them just as much constructive, but also affirmative feedback. They want that. They crave that because that is to them the the measure this the evidence that oh here we go we're doing it i'm moving i'm going right makes yeah. sense and so i i don't you know i and i feel like the tech culture has and it was a chicken before the egg is the tech culture creating that kind of frenzy sort of like let's go let's go or is that just another evidence of something in the water that it's generational that we like fast moving let's keep going what are we doing next i don't have a five year plan i have a five week plan and then we'll we'll reassess right well, so, you know, the internet, it, everything's going, stuff's developing really fast. Technology's developing really fast. You know, millennials we, we, being connected to everyone, we've seen companies having huge layoffs. So you don't see people at these companies for 30 years. So you're like, well, this comp you know, I could be at this job for two two months or I could be here for two years. I, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. All I'm going to look at is my own you know, development. That's how, that's at least the millennials I talk to. Yep. That's the mindset. It's a... Uh... Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's that. What I worry about in this, and and you, you kind of start tying the different types of burnout together, where we there's there's great expectations that people place on their employer, uh, things that they they expect from their employer, and it, even looking at something like recognition, right? It, that in my mind shouldn't be the determination between between whether you're happy or not right like that that needs to come from more from within so you know so peter you know has reported to me for how many years now a number of years right like do and I, do every day do i go hey great job awesome so so wonderful right i don't and if you needed that, it's just not my personality type. It's just not my style. And you know, Peter knows that. He right. knows it well at this point. But if he craved that, that would be a, a challenge, I think, right? If he needed to feel that pat on the back every single day versus just what I think is, uh, uh, hopefully, I don't mean to speak for Peter in any way right now, is balancing by having a lot of autonomy, not being micromanaged, not you know having a lot of freedom. Like, there's trade-offs, right, yes. that, that need to be there. So I... I I worry that that if people are looking for something unrealistic from yep. their situation, you know, they they need to be conscious of of that um, and just look at the situation as a whole. Yep. I don't know. That's I don't know if you agree with that. Peter, was I right about how I, I yeah. described? <laughs> to be fair, you you do. I mean, you do uh, like well. You do uh, recognize things. Just not if you're. It's not as a you know every week type of deal, but. Even and it is it's nice it's nice for any person to to feel like you know like oh you did you know good on this project or you're good on whatever um, this seems like the easiest type of burnout to fix really it's like just mm -hmm. make sure you're consistently paying attention to your employees and you know recognize them with, with some at least knowing in the back of your mind that like hey I got to let them know that they're they're moving like yeah. they're doing either good or they're you know or they're doing bad and you know fix this and you'll keep moving yeah hundred percent. But and you've also, but I think Pete, you've mentioned how you've communicated your style to Peter, and so he's not left in the dark. And what I, what I oftentimes hear is people, people leaders oftentimes assume that no news is good news, but an employee doesn't see it that way. Yeah. No news is almost always bad news. <laughs> and so what the analogy I always say is like when you leave someone in the dark, things grow in the dark that shouldn't be growing in the dark. That's bacteria, mm -hmm. you know. Horrible things grow in the dark. In the light, letting it out, being transparent is always going to be better. And so long periods of silence, lots of people, lots of younger generations are going to take that as this is not good. This is not good. I'm going to get a surprise attack. That's yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So last type of burnout. Let's get to it. Right. Because 
this one, uh, when you first explained it to me, I, I it was like, okay, help, help me understand. Give me an example. And, and you right. gave a great example of it. So I'll let you, I'll let you do that. I won't try to. What was the example I used? What was so great? What did I say? AI. You used a, yeah. you know, the, the need to learn AI, um, uh, you know, where you've been doing yeah. your job a certain way. Yeah. And, and this is, this is, so this is, I think, a big, you know, I, now, you, now I'm going to be very conscious of saying generational because I think it's more age than sure. anything else. It just happens to be the age that the generations are, right? So yeah, age and stage, being, yeah. Yeah, you know, I don't think I think this is, would probably have been the case you know, in any you know, generation where older people uh, have a more difficult time adapting to change. Yep. And I'll, I'll give you a classic example. So, and then it reverses it. And this is where like the skill works in. But um, I've been doing data analytics for a long time. And my area of expertise is psychometric. So I'm a statistician. So you run, give me the data. I will run predictive models. I'll do correlations. I'll do, I'll do ANOVAs and look comparative values. But there was one particular project where a big chunk of it had to be uh, Microsoft Excel queries. And lots of pages of queries to link certain people to certain things. And it's like, well, it's been 15 years since I took that course and learned that thing. And I probably spent 16 plus hours on just this one specific part of this part because I didn't know it wasn't like all the other stuff. But everything else, like I'd spent years learning how to do this thing so that I could knock out this, this analysis in four minutes, right? But if you don't know how to do the analysis, it's going to take you hours and hours. And I just remember just staying up and my wife's like, just go to bed. I'm like, I have to figure this out. It's driving me nuts. And I mean, when I was done with that project, it was like, tag, you're it. I don't want to see this thing for a while. But, you know, and so if you're forced to or have to get a new way of doing things and you have to start writing with your left hand and you've been writing with your right hand your whole life, like that's going to burn the wick so much quicker than, than other things. So yeah, when you start talking about like, oh, we should use Canva instead of PowerPoint, or we should, any new development technology, if you're asking that person to do it that isn't used to that, the amount of energy that goes into learning that new trade is exhausting. And if your whole field changes, oh boy, right? There's, do, there's a burnout. Do, do we, do we, does anyone disagree that this is an age, an age thing as much as anything else? Uh, that, uh, yeah, that's definitely an age thing. Um, it's like the, the the inverse being we talked about. I was I we've talked about uh, in the past. I said that Gen Z uh, have a harder time with technology when it breaks because they're like everything just works all the time. So if you have to actually like go in and sure. figure out why something's not working, they're like, but it, it, it's supposed to work. It's it always right. works. <laughs> it's right. true. There's nothing more frustrating than especially like like my mom's not good with technology, so she'll be like, or like I had family coming from Portugal, and they're like, why isn't the Wi-Fi working? And I'm like. I don't know. Like it's it's always working, right? And then they just expect me to fix it, and I'm like, I don't know how to fix this. So no, totally, I can, I get that. Yeah. It's definitely. But so it, my kids for years would say the Wi-Fi is down. I'm like the Wi-Fi is fine. The internet, however, is down <laughs> because in their mind they've never known. Right. They never had to dial up on anything. Right. right? <laughs> they have no idea what I, that's like. I own in my mind like. There's internet service and then there's Wi-Fi and one really doesn't have anything to do with the other as far as what's working and what isn't, but they've never known a difference. Yeah. And Ashley, I, are you hearing that going, well, what do you mean? Yeah, I'm kind <laughs> of confused like, now. Like I'm like, is that still like that? No. Is it yes. still like that? Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> it's my fine. internet service has been down frequently. My Wi-Fi just goes, it's, it's good. <laughs> it's always good. That's and crazy. That's, it's intentional by design, which each with each evolution of technology, the end user does not know how that technology works. I mean, you see that with cars, right? Like yeah. for decades, every human being that owned a car could fix their own car. And now it's like, I don't know, the light went on and I have no idea. <laughs> Even if I knew how to work on cars, it's all digital and everything. And I have a 190, I owned a 1902 Victorian in upstate New York and the furnace went out. So I went down there and relit the pilot light and call, you know, I called the guy to come down. He goes, yeah, you did it exactly right. I said, I should get a new furnace. He goes, don't you ever get a new furnace. This furnace is 80 years old, but you can fix every piece on this. You get a brand new furnace. The motherboard goes out. You'll have to, you'll just have to, you'll always be 
you know, tethered to the, to the service person has to come in and replace the whole thing. No, they can't be fixed. Right. And so I drive an old car, I can fix yeah. everything on it. I'm yeah. like, I don't want to have a computer in my car. Cause then I got to like program to actually <laughs> fix my car. <laughs> yeah. That's all by design. That's all, you know, we don't fix things. We replace them because it's more money for them. So what, what can we do then about the inevitability of this? Because everyone's getting going to get older. Every, everyone's going to have this struggle at some point. I mean, what, what advice do you have on this? Because some of these things we've talked about cannot be fixed, right? I mean, yeah. If your company comes out and takes a political stance on something and you don't like it, you're not going to change it. You have to decide whether you can live with it. If you're not getting praised, but you seek that, you have to decide whether you can live with it. I, I, think, I think executives need to be very strategic about new platforms that they adopt, new technologies they adopt. If they want the whole company on Slack or we want to use Asana project, we want to go to Monday.com, whatever it is, don't do that willy nilly. Make an executive decision and then give everybody ample resources and time to wrap their heads around that. And so if you're being a team that has decided to use this new tool, give the project lead a week off, let them have unlimited resources and trainings. And, and give them time to sort of wrap their head around it and recognize that this like we're building the plane as we're flying it is is only going to lead to burnout. Land the plane, go go figure out how it's being built and then lift off again, you know, but giving people ample time, energy and resources to figure that out. And and, yeah, maybe a younger brain is more plastic and so it can figure things out a little quicker. You know, there's research about digital natives. You know, my my child knew how to do an iPad by three and a half years old, but it took me a good year and a half to figure out mine when I got mine, you know, when I was 19 or 20 or whatever. So there is some truth to a younger brain adapting quicker to, to the technologies that are closer to them. Yeah. It sounds like the, 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 te the learning part is, I mean, that to me, that would be the, if I had, if I have something new and the year, but I've got like, you know, Hey, you got a week. You're, don't worry about producing anything. I expect you're going to be that. Just spend this week learning it. Right. And, you know, even for the first 90 days of it, I expect you're not going to be great at it, but you're going to be, be yep. you know, learning more and more. Like that seems like that would take a lot of the weight off of, you know, someone yep. being yeah. stressed about it. Yep. That's a, it's such a hard thing. It was so many tools coming out. Uh, uh, it, yeah. I just discovered a, a new one two days ago, right? Oh, that that came, it was something that I stumbled across. And thought, wow, we can use this. And I started using it. And then I shared it with everyone else. And that that's not going to stop. I mean, AI is only going to speed that up. I mean, I, I don't, um, I worry about that evolution. I mean, just in the time we've gone virtually uh, since COVID, we've, we what, Peter, we had, we had teams and then we had uh, we had something else in between. I still can't figure out teams. I've been using it for two years. I still can't. No, we, <laughs> nobody we, we actually nobody started, knows we how to use it. Teams. We started, we, we used, we used teams. We had a discord. We were like, Discord's how can we make right. this work? Whoa, and we finally yeah. settled on Slack because it was like that. But yeah, I mean, we, we've had multiple iterations of things just since COVID. Yeah. I still don't know how Discord works. I look at my Discord account and I try to we're play with Midjourney. That's why I like it. They're, they, they have the same functionality, basically. I'm 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 with Daniel. I, I just want I just want old dial-up sound. I don't want that. That's what I want coming back. Well, so, so Slack works because we all were doing AOL Instant Messenger as children. Yeah, I have my own message. It's crafted. You know? yeah. And so I I fervently believe that Gen Alpha will be when they're running the shop. It'll be uh digi It'll be video messages. It'll be it'll be Instagram Reels or TikTok. You know, it'll be like instead of emails, it'll be like here's 30 seconds of me explaining something, and then boom, it, you know, you get it sent to your Content already, we started. We, we get those like you know, the looms and stuff where people, yeah, the looms, like, yeah, the looms are coming. Are I actually like them. They're like, Here's this is broken, here's how to fix it, whatever. And I don't have yeah. to talk, to them. I can be like, just watch a one minute video, yeah, asynchronous video. And then, and then there'll be a bullet point and then a paragraph AI if you don't want to watch them, you just yeah. need the bullet points, right? It'll, it'll condense, mm -hmm. yeah. So that multimodal is coming. What well, well, here, here's something that I, I can't reconcile that you know, Gen Z and even more alpha. They are using YouTube for um, you know for search, so they're you know, okay. using YouTube in many cases more than Google. But to watch a video is not the quickest route to the answer. So I I, I find that fascinating. You know yeah. where we're in such a just in time, everything you know, hurry up, hurry up. But yet these guys are watching YouTube videos to learn, which I I just can't really reconcile. Do you have a thought on that? 
I put you on the spot with a question. You <laughs> me? <Anybody? laughs> yeah. Do you, do you think? I, I, uh, I always have thoughts. I'm letting them speak too now. I mean, you, YouTube is. I, I agree. It's it's it is, it is. I'm not a I'm not a YouTube watcher unless I'm trying to do a specific. If I'm trying to fix my car. Yes, I will go. If I'm trying to fix, you know, yeah. something, it's always fixing things. That, that YouTube is education for me. But and yeah, again, you got to you got to scrub through the video. Well, now you got to wait through ads to get scrub through the video. And I feel like, especially like in college, starting like Zoom and we didn't have in person classes. We had everything at home. YouTube was my best friend. I had to watch a lot of YouTube videos because if I wasn't getting enough from my professor and it was so hard to contact them at that time, yep. I would go watch a YouTube video. Even now I'm still kind of using like YouTube as my like Google search or TikTok too. You can search anything up on TikTok now. It's like a big search engine yeah, keywords. So. Google too now by Gen Z yeah. Alpha. And I feel like I'm, I guess it also depends on the person. Like I'm more of like a visual like learner. So I feel like seeing a video, like I don't mind if it's taking time because it's taking me step by step. And I feel like in the end, it's, I understand it quicker than just trying to figure it out on my own or having yeah. someone else like in person teach me. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Makes yeah, sense. They're, scrubbing, they're now scrubbing the scripts of YouTube, which makes it super accurate. So like, you don't need to mm -hmm. type all the description, but like at some point, I don't know how, how clear and clean it is now, but yeah, you'll start scrubbing scripts to know that like, oh, this is definitely how to change a three-way light switch circuit because we've scrubbed yeah. it and these, the, trust me, this is the one you want. Yeah. Uh, All right, good. that's good. It's good stuff. We've we've been on for, and this hour has flown yeah, by. We're past an hour. I don't, do, do we have any questions? We're not getting any questions. We're getting some good comments. No, no real questions. I didn't know if we, uh, we have just a minute or two for those. Uh, Josh, were you on the clock here? I'm not on the, I'm, I'm always, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm immune to burnout, so you can just keep me, <laughs> just back to back me. It's fine. There's, there's no burnout. No. So, um, if if you have a question, you know, fire away while while we have Josh. Uh, but this has been this has been great. There's so much to consider, and I um, certainly you know, from uh, from an introspective standpoint, when I hear a lot of the things you say, I I have to acknowledge I have made a lot of mistakes in uh, my communication by not considering um the way messages are, are are received right i know how they are intended but how they're received is different and um so there's a lot of improvement uh to come from from everything you've shared so great. it really seems like it. even just you know just having it explained and be like hey there's you know people can be burned out in all these different ways and here's kind of like how what they're feeling just knowing that it goes a really long way right to you know just be, you know, being aware and, and helping others that you're kind of seeing those signs in, you know, somebody who's feels like their job doesn't matter or somebody who's like, I've been on too many meetings all day long or, right. or what have you. Right. Yeah. Cause there's a, there's a recovery process for, for each of those and they're, and it looks different. And sometimes it's having a hard conversation with your manager going, I haven't felt recognized in a while and I don't know what it looks like to feel recognized, but I just need to bring that to you. And I'm risking myself doing that right. There's a, there's a coaching up that needs to happen. And I think there's a movement here of, of direct reports saying here, if you really want to motivate me and get me, you know, excited about this job, here's some things I think would be valuable for you to know. Right. And that's, and that's, that's really good. Yeah. I think Gen Z are they're the the particularly the generation that are like not afraid to do that and yeah, like yeah. here's what I need. Yep, here, here's what I need, and no games. But yeah, I'd I'd love to hear this more. I'd love to check in more. I'd love this more. Right. Yeah. And, and of course, we all want more money. So we that's yeah. You know, uh, here's what I need: more money. <laughs> here's what I need: thirty percent increase. In my well, and, and well, I mean that continues to be rank you know number one on any survey of what's important. Why you're leaving a job? Why you're taking one? Your satisfaction. Yeah, we can't we can't disregard that, even though everyone likes to say, oh, that's not as important. The data always indicates that. Right. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty. pretty right. Important. Right. And so, yeah, I guess my lasting advice to a, to a leader who's hired a new crop of of people straight out of college or, you know, early 20s or whatnot, is that there is an age stage with with wanting community connection, culture, relation, healthy relational climate. And so if you're if you're in your late 50s and you're leading a team and you've got all of your needs met 
through relationships and culture and you've got your friend group and you've got family and you've got extended family and this is just a job to you and you don't know why we can't just separate the personal from the professional. You're leading a group of people that just left college or just left graduate school and they got used to that camaraderie and collective thought and brainstorming and let's go out for happy hour afterwards that a lot of the people that they work with, they do want that kind of friendship and, and relationship. And so to recognize that of going, like, oh, there are still some people that want to create that kind of culture and climate. Um, okay. Yeah. And that's not silly. And that's not, not even a Gen Z thing. It might just be a 24 year old thing. Right. And so. Um, that makes that, that sense. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I, that, that's great. I think that's a great point to end on. Um, Ashley, Peter, anything you guys uh, want to share before we close? No, I mean, I think we've, yeah. we have, we have covered the entire uh, spectrum of, uh, of, of burning out of jobs and hopefully maybe helped some people not yeah. quite so alone. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Ashley, your dog is ready to. I know. To she's out. looking oh. right at the camera. <laughs> like, like, yeah. She closed the door on herself. <laughs> So Josh, can't thank you enough for taking this time. Oh. Very generous of you. Really appreciate the uh, the education and, and everything you shared. So um, thank you. Yeah, thank you so Great. much. Thank you. Everyone, guys. thanks for being with us today. Thanks for the comments as always. We'll see you next week. All right. See you next week. Bye. Bye.